Please be aware that the comments, views, opinions shared on this podcast are not meant to diagnose a medical problem and or legal problem. If you do have a medical problem or legal problem, kindly contact a professional. Welcome to An Apple A Day, a podcast, a resource, a community. Share your experiences and learn from others as we overcome barriers and learn to live a happy, healthy life with a disability. Welcome to the community. Here's your host, Jimmy Apple. Welcome to another episode of An Apple A Day. I'm your host, Jimmy Apple. How are you doing today, my friends? How are you feeling? You're feeling better than you did yesterday? Feeling stronger? Can't ask for better than that, right? How are you making out with this coronavirus, this COVID-19? It seems that there's something new creeping up every day. I hope you're staying safe. I hope you're staying put. Before we start, I want to remind you, an Apple a Day is brought to you by www.famousapple.com. Famousapple.com is the home site for this podcast. So if you get a minute, go over there, check it out. Well, we have some changes for today. We were originally going to have guests on from Hope for Ataxia. But unfortunately, technical difficulties on our end here, we have to postpone the interview only till next week as long as we can get the parts in that we need for our communication center here. But we did blow an amplifier out, and everything's running behind because they're so busy getting uh, supplies for the hospitals shipped here into New York. This is what they consider non-essential equipment. So let's get the medical equipment in first, I, I, I say. But the people from Hope for Ataxia, they're very kind, and they're willing to come on as soon as we get the new part in. So hopefully that'll be this week and we can have them on next Friday. But in the meantime, go over to their Facebook page and check them out. They're at Facebook slash Hope for Ataxia. They're in the groups. It's a Facebook group. It's Facebook Hope for Ataxia. It's a nice group, nice group of people, big group of people, and you can learn some stuff over there. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting site. All right, even though we're going to miss Mark and Courtney from Hope for a Taxia for today anyway, we'll, we'll talk to him next week. I do have a pretty good one for you today. We do have an update on the coronavirus, and we do have some information on what to do right when you're filing for workers' compensation insurance, when you get hurt on the job. We're going to discuss that. We're also going to discuss 10 signs that, that come up when you need to hire a new injury lawyer. That's right. You know, people think that when you hire a lawyer, you can't fire them for some reason, especially when it comes to workers' comp or social security disability, a third-party lawsuit. They feel like you're, you're in an accident lawsuit. You can't fire your, your attorney. You most certainly can. And we're going to give you 10 signs that you should watch out for when you're hiring an attorney. We're also going to go over seven mistakes that people make when they're filing a workers' comp claim. So this is a pretty good one. This is a very informative one today. And I think you should listen. <laughs> All right. Let's get started here. All right. Let's start with the COVID-19, the coronavirus. I have an article here from the New York Post that I want to share with you. It says coronavirus can survive on shoes for up to five days, experts warn. The coronavirus is known to make its home on many non-human surfaces, including doorknobs, cardboard boxes, and shopping carts. Now, to the surprise of probably no one, shoes are being called the breeding ground for germs by experts. Infectious disease specialist Mary E. Schmidt warns that the coronavirus can survive on rubber, leather, and PVC-based soles for five days or more, the Huffington Post UK reported, and has even suggested that individuals don shoes that are machine washable. Depending on what materials are used to make the shoe, the pathogen can remain on the shoes for days and on the upper part as well. The National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease found that the COVID-19 can survive on plastic for up to two or three days, meaning that shoes featuring plastic components are also risky, though that's not a primary concern for some doctors. The sole of the shoe is the breeding ground for more bacteria, fungi, and viruses than the upper part of the shoe, emergency physician Pickney tells the Huffington Post. In 2008, a study by microbiologists at the University of Arizona found that the average shoe sole contains some 421,000 bacteria, viruses, and parasites. 
However, Pickney reminds us that many of these microorganisms influence and allow us to develop immunity. So in many ways, they could be helping us stay healthier. Nevertheless, public health specialist Carol Winner says taking your shoes off before entering your home is a smart measure for anyone. If you can leave them in your garage or in your entryway, that would be ideal as you don't necessarily have to leave them outside, she tells the Huff Post. The idea is just not to track them throughout your house. Schmidt adds concern for children especially and advises parents to especially be mindful of how children handle their shoes. You have to hide the shoes from small children to ensure that they don't touch them, she says. Teach them not to touch the shoes unless they are designated indoor shoes as shoes are the dirtiest objects in our home other than the toilets. Winter attempts to quell fears, telling individuals to focus more on personal hygiene and hand washing rather than what's living on the bottom of your shoes. There's no evidence to say that the coronavirus comes into the house from the shoes, she says. Pragmatically, they are on the body part furthest from your face, and we do know that the greatest risk of transmission is from person to person, not shoe to person. Still, <laughs> it's it's a rule in my house. You take your shoes off when you come in the house. I don't want I don't want anything being tracked through the house. And now now more than ever, I never made strangers take their shoes off, but I'm gonna in the future. Right now, nobody comes to the house. Right now, it's just myself, my wife, my dogs, my cat. That's it. We're we're staying put. You know, we're we're quarantined like the rest of the state of New York. But from now on, no, you can't. You have to be careful. It. it it's, it's scary out there, folks. It's definitely scary. Now, also with this coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, you may have noticed it already in your emails or in your messenger or on Facebook. There are thousands of charities popping up saying they're collecting for the sick people. They're collecting for the first responders. They're collecting for the police. They're collecting for the fire department. You may have got emails from the CDC or the WHO, you know, the World Health Organization, offering to test you for the coronavirus. It's all bull. It's all bull crap, my friends. They're looking for ways to get your information. I want to warn you, do not click on links from emails that you don't know who the sender is. It's very nice. They word them very nice sometimes. Uh... You know, they want to support the local police. They want to support the local ambulance corps. They want to support the doctors. They want to, you know, they want to support the sick people. They want to buy them food. Read these emails. They're phonies. Look for the misspellings in them. Stick with the charities that you know. Don't do it over the internet. Don't go to these blind sites that are just emailing you. And the other thing is, is the CDC is not going to email you. Trust me. Neither is the World Health Organization. They're not going to email you and say, we want to give you a test. Trust me, they don't. And they're not selling the coronavirus tests. They're they're not selling them. And there is no cure. There is no cure that they're selling over the internet. Silver isn't a cure. Uh, Silver-based toothpaste isn't a cure. Uh, Rubbing iodine on your forehead isn't a cure. There is no cure. The the scientists are working on it right now. Don't believe what comes in, in your emails. Don't believe the phone calls that are coming. And if you get them, call the inspector general. Call the office of the inspector general. Report them, okay? Don't fall for them. Look at the emails that are coming. You're going to notice they, they spell CDC wrong. <laughs> If you want some comic relief, read them, but don't click on anything. Don't open up any links in those in those emails or in the text messages or anything like that. Get rid of them. Just get rid of them. Don't answer them. Pay no mind to them. Get rid of them. All right, let's move on here. Okay, let's touch on workers' compensation here for a second. Everybody knows what workers' compensation is, right? You're on the job. You work in a job, you get hurt on the job, you collect workers' compensation, they cover your doctor's bills, and so on and so forth. Sounds pretty easy, right? You would think. But there's seven mistakes that people make when it comes to filing a workers' comp claim that can end up costing them. I got a report here, okay? It says each year, more than 3 million people in the United States are injured in on-the-job-related accidents. Fortunately, 
Many of them are eligible for workers' compensation, which can cover their medical bills and lost wages. Well, the lost wages, that's debatable. Trust me. However, you can go wrong when filing, and it may cost you a great deal. Here are seven mistakes to watch out for when you go through the process of obtaining workers' compensation for your injury. The first big mistake that most people make, and you wouldn't think that this would, this would happen, but it does, is not filing a report. While it's true that some injuries don't present themselves immediately, it's vital that you report the injury as soon as possible. If you have an employee handbook, follow the protocol up outlined there. If not, write down what happened with the date and the time of the injury and submit it to your superiors. You know, look at it like this. You, here's an example. And I, I go back to my work history for this. I knew somebody. He was on a truck. He was unloading the truck. He slipped off the tailgate. When he did, he slipped between the tailgate and the loading dock, and he hurt his knee. Well, he jammed his knee. But he was walking. He had a bit of a limp. He says, ah, not gonna, it's not bad. It's not bad. The next day, he couldn't walk on his leg. His knee was so swollen, and he stayed home from work, figured he'd ice it and everything else. Well, he was out for a couple of days. He comes back three days later, and he says to the boss, he says, um, I got hurt. He says, I fell off the truck. And boss says, well, how come you didn't tell us when this happened? He says, well, he says, I didn't think it was any big thing. He says, but it's swelled up. Look at it. It's all black. He says, how do I know you didn't do this at home? Long story short, the guy never got, never got paid workers' comp. They, they went to court. He ended up losing because he had no proof. He never submitted anything. It was his word against the, uh, against the boss's word. And on top of that, he ended up losing his job. You get hurt at work, even if it's nothing. It could be nothing. You go in and file an accident report. Doesn't mean you're going to sue them. Doesn't mean you're going to go after them for money or anything like that. But you want it on record that you got hurt. So the first thing you do, if you fall, trip, cut your finger, anything, you go in and you report it, you fill out an accident report, no matter what. The second big mistake is seeing only one doctor, okay? It's very possible that your employer will send you to a physician of their choosing for an assessment of your injury. However, this might serve their own interest, not necessarily yours. Always get a second opinion, all right? Always get a second opinion from a healthcare professional who you would consider more impartial. Not saying that your boss is going to try and screw you, but they have they have doctors that are recommended by their insurance company, and the insurance company is in the business to collect money, not pay it out. So keep that in the back of your mind, and you're entitled to a second opinion. So make sure you get a second opinion. If your boss sends you to a doctor, a particular doctor, then make sure you get a second opinion. If he tells you to go off to go to the hospital or go to a doctor if you're choosing, well, then you pick out your doctor. Third mistake, and this is a biggie, and this isn't just with workers' comp. This is with a lot of other legal things, too, is talking too much. <laughs> when it comes to your employer or the insurance company, answer their questions honestly, but do not volunteer a lot of information that they did not request. You should also avoid posting about this incident on social media. That's very important. There's no telling what you might say that completely blows your case. Too many people today are looking to put their entire life on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Instachat, whatever it is. Say very little. Say what you have to say. It's nobody else's business about your accident. It's nobody else's business how it happened. Very little. Very little. Be honest with the doctor. Be honest with the insurance company. But don't overdo it. Don't give them more information than what they're asking for, in other words. Okay? Just answer the questions. Answer them honestly. Right to the point. Nothing extra. The fourth big mistake that people make is being vague with the doctor. Yeah, believe that. The one person who needs the details is the doctor you choose to see you post-injury. Let them know how the injury happened and exactly how it is impacting you right now. This will contribute to valuable records that could serve your case well. If your employer fights your claim, a doctor's word will become more than helpful. It could serve as the basis for you being awarded what you're owed. Never embellish with your doctor and don't underscore it with your doctor. In other words, don't go to the doctor and you're hurting, but you can deal with it. You know what I mean? You're a macho guy or you're a tough girl. I, I can deal with the pain. Eh, it's okay. No, if you have pain, you tell a doctor you have pain. And it's always on a scale of one to 10. And you tell them, well, right now it's about a three. Or right now it's about a 10. But never say, ah, eh, it's okay. Unless it's okay. If it's okay and you have zero pain, you tell them, I have zero pain. 
But if you have any pain at all, you make sure you tell the doctor you have this much pain and tell him exactly how the accident happened and exactly what happened. And any kind of noise, you might have heard a pop, you might have you might have got cut, you might have a burning sensation. You may have you may have hurt your leg but have a pain in your back. Make sure you let the doctor know that. Any pain that you have after an injury, it could be a pain to you, you your injury may be to your foot. But the pain, may, you may have a pain in your neck. You let the doctor know. All right. Next big mistake. Number five is ignoring your doctor's advice. Failure to follow recovery instructions can lead to not getting the full amount of compensation you need. If you're already receiving some benefits, they could be cut if, for instance, you do not attend physical therapy. Now, I know how easy it is to say, I don't feel like going today. How many times have I said it in the podcast here? Make sure you go to your physical therapy appointments. Always, always, always keep your appointments. If you're home and you're not working, your health is now your job. And that's your primary focus. You don't miss your doctor's appointments. You don't miss your physical therapy appointments. Once they see that you're ignoring your doctor's advice, they're going to assume that maybe you're exaggerating this and you'll end up losing. Number six, big, big problem. Number six, being lax about deadlines. What can a workers' compensation law firm do for you? One of the biggest upsides is that they are well-versed in the process of obtaining compensation and know when various filings and types of information are due. If you miss a deadline or fail to include all the information required, you could miss out. That's why it is a good idea to have an attorney for your workers' compensation. Trying to go through the compensation system by yourself is very, very, very difficult. Very difficult. The last big mistake people make, number seven, is remaining unemployed. You should return to work when your doctor gives you the okay. Have your doctor confirm whether or not you need to be accommodated in any special ways post-injury. In the event you can no longer return to your regular place of employment, you should ask about vocational training or placement as part of your compensation package. Sometimes workers' compensation can be trickier than you thought. Even if your injury or the cause is obvious, the process provides plenty of room for error. Therefore, it's wise. It is wise to have an attorney to help you through this. These are seven mistakes people make, and these things that people look at it and they're saying, well, I don't need an attorney for this and I'm going to save some money. And believe me, you're not saving anything. You're not saving anything. It's better to have an expert on your side, but you have to, you have to really look at these attorneys and we're going to talk about that next. But just remember this, when you're doing your, when you're doing your workers' comp, if you're filing a workers' comp claim, honesty, honesty is the most important thing. Honesty, I can't stress that enough because if you get caught lying, Remember this, if you get caught lying, that's fraud. Not only will you have to pay it back, you can be prosecuted. So don't lie. Don't try and make something out of it that it's not. But make sure that you cover yourself. It's very important you cover yourself because that's how you're going to support yourself and your family, keep a roof over your head, keep food on the table, and so on. All right? All right. Here's a multiple choice question for you. You're in an accident, okay? Car hits you. You're you're bruised up. You're bleeding. What's the first thing you do? A, you call an ambulance. B, you call a lawyer. C, you call a cop. D, you call your mommy. The answer's on the other side of this. If you get hurt, whether it's at work or in a car accident or walking down the street or falling down a flight of stairs, whatever. If you get hurt, the first thing you do, contrary to what you see on these TV commercials for lawyers, is you call an ambulance. You call a doctor. You take care of your health. Your health is your primary concern. That's the first thing you do. Make sure that you're, you're taken care of physically and after that, once you're out of the hospital, you can then look into an attorney if you, if you need it. But calling an attorney from an accident scene like they depict in these commercials, that's a crock of crap. You don't, call an amb- you don't call an ambulance chaser or an attorney from an accident scene. You call an ambulance, you go to the doctor, you go to the hospital, you get taken care of. Then you worry about the legal problem next, but not, not the primary thing. The primary thing when you get hurt is your health. Remember that. Now, what's the best way to get a lawyer? (laughs) I'm going to tell you right now, the best way is not to get a lawyer. When I was in the hospital after I had an accident, I was recovering and 
I had a man come into my room and he, he knew my name and he knew about my accident and he knew a lot about me. I didn't know who he was or where he came from. And then he handed me his card. He was an attorney. I said, who sent you here? He says, oh, I visit the people on the floor. Let me tell you something. That's a big mistake. Don't come soliciting me, okay? If you got to come looking for work, you mustn't be that busy. I want an attorney that knows what he's doing. I don't need a salesman. I need an attorney that knows what he's doing. If he's out there looking for work, nine times out of 10, he's the type of attorney that might take the first offer from a, from a, an insurance company because he needs the money as well. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. I may be wrong, but that's just the way I think. When I had to get an attorney, I got my attorney by reference from someone else. I would never take an attorney off of TV. I don't care. I, don't, I mean, they may be the best in the world, but you can't trust an attorney that's going to promise you a certain amount of money or try to sell you on a certain amount of money. You ever see those commercials? Oh, I got a million six for this guy. I got six million for that guy. I got 500,000 for this guy. You know, and it even tells you in small print, you know, what they did in the past doesn't guarantee you anything. But they don't tell you that when they're talking. But they tell you all these big numbers. So that's dazzling your eyes. It's like game show numbers. Believe me. Talk to someone who's used an attorney. Check that attorney out with the Bar Association. Do your due diligence. You don't want someone that's an ambulance chaser. You don't want someone that's brand new on their own, trying to build a, build a reputation, trying to build an office, trying to get some money in. You want somebody that's experienced. Now, we all make mistakes, though. And there's 10 signs. Like, if you hire an attorney and you're not getting a good feeling, there's 10 signs you, you should know that you may need to hire a new attorney. And, you know, people are funny because... They hire these injury attorneys or compensation attorneys or social security disability attorneys. And they think once they have them, they can't get rid of them. No, that's not true. That's not true. You have the right to fire your attorney. And believe me, there's cases where they should be fired. But I do have another report here. And it's 10 signs that you should know when you need to hire a new attorney. If you're unsure about your current legal representation, when you hire a, a personal injury attorney, you want a legal professional who knows how to handle your case and can provide legal counsel in a caring and compassionate manner. Not only that, but you want a lawyer who has the experience and legal knowledge to back up their promises to you. When a legal, legal advocate starts to make unrealistic promises and guarantees to you and guarantees you compensation, a red flag should go up immediately. Unfortunately, many lawyers have been known to be dishonest with clients, creating a rift between the attorney-client relationship. If you're experiencing something similar, it may be time to change attorneys. Notice these signs. It may be time for a switch. Just because you notice a small issue with your legal advocate does not mean you should head for the door. Normally, there are several factors that, that expose your lawyer as the wrong fit. It may not even mean your attorney is a bad legal professional, just that they are not capable of handling a specific case. All right, here are some of the warning signs that you have to look for. Number one, poor communication. One of the most important aspects of a client-attorney relationship is communication. When your attorney fails to communicate with you in an effective manner, it can weaken your case and cause frustration along the way. Lack of personal support and representation. When you call the office, the staff and other lawyers should know who you are and at least some details of your case. If the firm is too big or doesn't care enough about your case, it could get lost in the stacks of other claims. Unanswered or unreturned phone calls. If you continue to leave messages or call your attorney with questions, yet you can't seem to get them to pick up or respond, there may be a problem. You need an attorney who's willing to be ready to communicate with you. You remain uninformed on what's going on with your case. Do you know the details of your case? Are you unsure of what phase your claim is in? Your attorney should be keeping you informed every step of the way. A new person answers the phone every time you call. If a, if a new staff member is answering the phone every time you call, that means there's a big turnover rate, also indicating poor work environment in the attorney's office. No response to your important emails. If a lawyer fails to communicate with you through phone or email, it's a serious warning sign that they either don't care or they're too busy to dedicate enough time to your case. Here, this is, this is what I was talking about with the 
TV advertisement. The firm advertises cheap or discounted legal services. While it's never bad to work with a firm that offers affordable and reasonable legal services, those that advertise discounted or cheap fees may be fishing for more work. That often indicates a lack of respect for the legal community and poor reputation. The state bar has a discipline problem with your firm. You should always, you should always check the attorney's background and his or her standing with the bar association before hiring them. If they have been disciplined by the state bar, it may be hard to trust them in the future. Numerous negative reviews on social media. We live in an age of social media and online reviews. Though some can be vengeful or full of false critiques, many are from the honest people who have had bad experiences with an attorney. If you notice a bad standing on numerous review-based sites, it may be time to move on. Now those are good to keep in mind, okay? Those are just some red flags to look at. They're not, they're not set in stone, set in concrete, but do your due diligence. Always check out, never partner up with someone that, that's, that can make a lot of money off of you. Don't forget, an attorney gets a third of whatever your settlement is. And the other thing to remember, when you have a, an accident case or a worker's comp case, you don't pay a retainer up front. Any, any attorney that's asking you for a retainer for a, for a claim case like this, I, I'd go to another attorney. You don't put money up front. They work on a fee. They get a third if you win. And remember, you also have expenses with your, with your case. So always get all the information from your attorney. Anything you do with the attorney, anything, make sure you get it in writing. All right? Don't do it on a handshake. <laughs> An attorney wouldn't do it with you on a handshake. Trust me. Don't do it on a handshake. You're not insulting him. Actually, you're showing him that you're, you're a little bit of ahead of the rest. You want everything in writing. You want to know what the expenses are going to be. You want to know what the what his final settlement will be, whether it be a third, a 33rd, and a third, whatever it is. You want to know everything in writing before you sign a contract with an attorney. Make sure of that. Well, that's it for today. I'd like to thank you for stopping by. I hope it helped you. hope the information helped you out a little bit. And again, I'd like to apologize to Mark and Courtney from Hope for Ataxia. And if you get a chance, go over there and visit their website. It's Facebook slash Hope for Ataxia. Check them out. It's a very interesting website. We'll have them on next week. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to speaking with them. Very nice people. All right, listen, I want to leave you with a thought today. No one has ever gone blind looking at something from the bright side. So try it. Try looking at something from the bright side. And remember this, my friends. Things can always be worse. No matter what, someone somewhere wishes they were in your position right now. So things can always be worse. And listen, stay safe. Stay put. Stay inside. Don't let this virus get to you. Don't let it get to you, please. You've been listening to An Apple a Day. My name is Jimmy Apple. And remember, the best medicine, the very best medicine, is laughter. Have a nice weekend, my friends. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to An Apple a Day with Jimmy Apple, your gateway to a happy, healthy life. Join our community at www.famousapple.com. See you next time.